The subalpine chains of southeast France are a fold thrust belt and a remarkable natural laboratory for understanding how fold thrust systems are structured. So where are we? Well, we're down here in southeast France on the edge of the Western Alps. And this region consists of stacked Mesozoic strata, which are dominated by thick limestone sequences. And the thrust belt has developed as a mixture of an emergent thrust system, which has broken out to the Earth's surface, another part which developed underneath a far-travelled thrust sheet, which was derived from more internal parts of the Alps. The deformation is of Miocene age and is detached from the underlying crystalline basement, so it's essentially a thin-skinned thrust belt. It's a classic example. So let's add some geology onto this area. So this is the subalpine thrust belt. On the simplified geological map, the blue rocks are Jurassic, the green rocks are the overlying younger Cretaceous rocks, and tertiary strata, most of which was derived from the Alps as they were forming. So this is generally referred to as molasse. The pink rocks on here are crystalline basements, so they do come up to outcrop further to the east in the region. So the basement that comes up to outcrop are called the external basement massifs. They lie ahead of the frontal pennine thrust, which is a structure that carries parts of the internal Alps out over these external zone rocks. And you'll see that the frontal pennine thrust has an important clipper out there to the north, the pre-alpine clipper. The western margin of the deformed Alps is shown by that dashed line, which is the thrust front. And lying against the thrust front is the Jura fold belt. The area we're interested in is the subalpine chains, which lie slightly ahead of the external basement massifs. In the north, they're separated from the deformation front by the Jura fold belt. But further south, the subalpine chains form the most outlying structures of the Alps. And between these deformed Mesozoic strata are the tertiary basins. The Breast Basin and the Bastophany Basin are essentially part of the foreland. The Annecy Swiss Basin lies between the Jura Fell Belt and the subalpine chains. So let's look at a cross section to see how the Jura and subalps relate to one another. Here it is. So the sections oriented west, northwest, east, southeast. So left is west. So we can see the deformation front there on the left-hand side. That's the Jura fold belt. To its east lies the Annecy Basin. And you'll see that that tertiary basin is underlain by the Mesozoic strata. The thrust belt continues at depth beneath the Annecy Basin. And the Annecy Basin separates the outcrop of the Jura fold belt from the subalps that lies further to the east-southeast. Eventually, basement comes up to outcrop, but beneath the Jura and subalps, the basement is believed not to be involved, so it forms a rigid underpinnings to this thin skin thrust belt. So let's just briefly look at the Jura fold belt. Just zoom in part of the cross section, it's still pretty simplified. You can see that the Jura fold belt is detached from the underlying basement. That detachment is provided by a thin layer of Triassic aged evaporites. And these evaporites have been dropped down by normal faults on the left hand, that's the western side of the cross section, so the thrust system can't access the detachment horizon. So the thrust front here is controlled by the presence of these normal faults, which predate the thrust structures, not by very much, and they form the margin to the breast basin. So normal faults, pre existing structures, control the position of the thrust front on this cross section. But we're not going to consider the Jura fell belt much more. We're more concerned with the subalpine chains. So let's provide a bit more information, some context to the subalpine chains. Well, first of all, the thrusting direction, which you can determine by measuring striations on faults up and down the subalps, are shown by those red arrows. So generally, west-northwest. But what conditions were the rocks deforming at while they were thrusting? Well, we can use paleothermal data measuring organic maturation within carbonaceous rocks within the thrust belt. And these can be used to determine peak burial temperatures. So in the north, the rocks were deforming at temperatures in excess of 200 degrees centigrade. But by the time we're down in the south, 
the temperature of deformation was significantly less than 80 degrees centigrade. Indeed, it was so low, it's very hard to, to determine through organic maturation. Similarly, as we move out towards the Jura, the deformation temperatures decrease down again to about 75 or 80 degrees centigrade or even lower by the time we end out in the Jura themselves. So why the differences from north to south? Well, one prime explanation is that in the north, the thrust systems were developed beneath a covering of thrust sheets, the pre-alpine thrust sheets. So I've just sketched in the distribution of these thrust sheets on the map. And you can see on the cross section that there's a vestigial patch of this once continuous thrust sheet shown by the dark green lying in that sin form beneath the captioned subalpine chains. So originally the thrust sheet would have continued over these thrust structures and has subsequently been eroded so we can see through into the thrust structures of the subalps. And this extra blanket of rocks over the top allowed the rocks of the subalpine chains in the north to acquire higher temperatures. So these northern areas developed buried beneath the pre-alpine thrust sheets, but further out to the west and in the south, the thrust systems were not covered by this thrust sheet. In other words, they broke through to the Earth's surface. They were emergent. Consequently, they break out onto the uh, tertiary synorogenic sediments. Well, we can go and look at one of these emergent thrusts down here on the edge of the Chartreuse district. It's a structure called the Varep thrust, and we're going to look onto a hillside looking back down the transport direction. In other words, in the direction shown by that red arrow. So here we are onto this hillside. We're looking east. The thrusting direction was out towards us, and we'll add the thrust on as we go. So we're looking at about 1,500 metres of hillside. Grand Sur at the top of the hill there is a shade over 1,900 metres. And down at the bottom, uh, the house there is at about 440 metres above sea level. So let's add some geology onto this landscape. Well, at the top of the hill, we've got Valanginian limestones. So that's lower Cretaceous um, platform carbonates up at the top there. As we come down the hill, this area here is picked out by a crag of Tithonian, that's uppermost Jurassic uh, limestones. But what about these sandy coloured rocks that lie around 900 metres and below? Well, these are upper Miocene sandstones, the molasse. So the thrust runs through here, sometimes hidden by those wooded slopes. So this is the Vorep thrust. We'll see this again shortly. So what about the stratigraphy? Well, out in the Jura, the Mesozoic strata are dominantly platform carbonate, stack one on top of the other and are capped by an unconformity upon rest of the tertiary molasse sandstones. But this stratigraphic section expands radically as we move into the subalpine chains. The sections expanded, the units are thicker, and they're also important shale units that break up the carbonate platform rocks. Let's just consider one of these, the Ergonian limestone, which is actually one of the major cliff forming units uh, through the subalpine chains and makes them some pretty dramatic landscapes. So here's a paleogeography for the Ergonian for southeast France. You can just about make out the basement massifs on this paleogeography. They've yet to form, they're shown by that red dashed line, and you can use that to tie to the geological map on the left. So this is the map area. So the paleogeographic map extends all the way down to the coast of the Mediterranean. A platform forms a rim around the Vacontian and Dauphinois basins, which would have extended out towards Tethys, which subsequently closed to form the Alps. And the Ogonian carbonate platform is built out across Jurassic rift basins. So the edge of the Jurassic basins is shown on the map by that dashed line. And we can represent it in this cross section which is oriented northwest southeast from the Jura platform into an underfilled basin. The Tithonian limestone essentially blankets the region and seals off the Jurassic Rift basins at depth. And across from the Jura, the platforms have built out, filling in the underfilled basin towards the southeast, but not completely. 
So we have a succession like this, where the darker colours represent the platform carbonates, the lighter green is a shale-dominated cretaceous succession. And you'll see, even by the end of this process, we still have an underfill basin over there on the southeast side. So that's a depositional model for the Cretaceous rocks in this part of southeast France that will become the subalpine chains in Jura. The closely spaced limestones of the Jura platform and the expanded stratigraphic section beneath the Ergonian platform edge from which the future subalpine chains will be derived. And this region here is a limestone shale multi layer. So let's go and look at the field evidence for this expanded stratigraphy. And we're going to go down to the Chartreuse district, just near the city of Grenoble. And so let's just look at a map of this southern area. Looking at the more detailed map, you can see the Argonian platform shown by that tan colour, other Cretaceous rocks in green, and the blue Jurassic rocks that have come up from underneath. The yellow, again, is the Miocene Malasse. So we're going to look at the Isère transect. We're going to look at it from a hillside spanning those two red arrows. And here it is. It's a pretty dramatic hillside. At the bottom of the valley, you can see the uh, Isère River running out. Grenoble would be over on the right hand side of this image, just behind that bit of vegetation that's obscuring the view. But we're not interested in the city. We're interested in the geology that we can see here. So which way are we looking? Well, the left-hand side there, we're looking north-northeast, and it's more easterly over on the right-hand side. So overall, we're looking sort of northeast-ish. So the thrusting direction is from right to left across here. Let's add some scale. So the hillside opposite is about 14 kilometers long, and various elevations picked out. So the Azare Valley itself is about 200 meters above sea level, and the hills rise to almost two kilometers above sea level uh, in the Chartreuse uh, hills that we're looking into here. Okay, how about the geology? Well, on the left here, we have an anticline, called by blue, which is Jurassic rocks, it's the Tithonian, going up to uh, Ergonian in the orange, and then some Miocene in yellow. So there we have these rocks labelled up for us. And there's our friend, the Varep thrust that we looked at on the hillside. And the hillside we looked onto is essentially the profile uh, that's on the skyline of this view. But what about the rocks that lie in the hanging wall, in other words, above the Varep thrust? Well, let's put these on. There's another thrust at the back. We're not too worried about this, but let's look at some of these units. We've got the Tithonian in light blue here, and our friend the Ergonian at the back. Just look how expanded the succession is here between the Tithonian and Ergonian limestones. It's all this distance in here. So a radical expansion of stratigraphy as we move across from the foot wall to the hanging wall of the Varep thrust, and we go from a Jura stratigraphy into a subalpine stratigraphy. Again, just to emphasize the scale in these landscapes. So, stratigraphy, Jura, thin stacked platform carbonates, that's the, that's the Cretaceous thickness that I've labelled up here, expanding up the Cretaceous as we go into the Chartreuse, part of the subalpine chains. And it's not just the Cretaceous that's expanded, so too is the Jurassic as we move into the rift basins that are forming on this part of the European margin of Tethys. So different stratigraphies. So we expect these different stratigraphies to generate different structures. In the Jura fold belt, we've just got closely spaced limestone sequences, and it's a multi-layer of stronger, competent limestone separated by incompetent shale in the subalpine chains. So let's go on a tour back towards our cross-section. We'll start off by looking back towards the cross-section from the Chartreuse. Here we are. The Jura on the left, we're looking towards the north, and the subalps over on the right, that's on the eastern side, and these cliff-forming limestones are the Ergonian, making these dramatic landscapes. So let's look at the cross-section through here. 
Here's a detail of the cross section we've seen already, and we can use this to explore different structural styles just very briefly, contrasting the Jura stratigraphy with the subalpine. So if we look at the left-hand side of this, we have a Jura style stratigraphy and structure. It's a simple thrust and fold structure. All the layers seem to be deforming together. But what about the subalps? In here, in this area of the subalpine chains, our competent limestones are separated by shales, and the deformation style involves buckling. So we have fold structures like this. Again, this is our Ogonian limestone package, forming this rather spectacular fold pair, an upright antiform synform pair. And in this area, one that tips over a bit, so I'll just pick out the base of the Ogonian round like this. We're seeing into the fold to see the older Cretaceous rocks in the core. So this anticline forming at the front of this fold train. So buckling is a really important process in the subalps because of this multi-layer stratigraphy. So different structural styles in different parts of the cross section, which reflect different stratigraphic templates. The stratigraphy has expanded on this restored section from the west, where it's platform dominated, to the multi-layer over on the eastern side. And consequently, the deformation style has changed from deforming together in the Jura to buckling and thrusts in the multi-layer dominant subalpine sequences. So a brief overview of the structural setting of the French subalpine chains, and hopefully I've whetted your appetite to find out more about the deformation styles within different parts of the subalpine chains. These are covered in more detail in their own videos for each section. It's a wonderful natural laboratory for fold thrust tectonics with spectacular outcrops.